Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see all of you. My name is Jim Ryan, and I'm the dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I am delighted to uh, announce the beginning of the master class series. So let me tell you a little bit about um, why and how before I introduce our master teacher. Um, Harvard University is well known for having some of the best researchers in the world, but it's also a place that has some of the very best teachers in the world. And as an ed school, we are intensely interested in what makes for good teaching. And so our thought behind this series is to both celebrate and showcase good teaching. Um, the way it's going to work is pretty straightforward. We will invite faculty from across the university as our master teachers who will actually teach a class just as they would. And then we will have a facilitator who, after the class, um, will, with your help, interview the master teacher to get a sense of why and how, why were some choices made, why was the class taught in that particular way. That's the basic idea. Uh, and it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce our first master teacher, David Malin, who is a senior lecturer in computer science at the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Um, David is best known for teaching the um, CS50 class on uh, computer science and programming and the online version CS50X. Uh, the class is enormously popular as indicated by the numbers. In 2006, before David began teaching the class, there were roughly 130 students enrolled. In 2013, there were 700. That's on campus. The course has also been enormously influential on student choices. In 2006, there were roughly 25 students who chose computer science as their concentration. Last year, that number was 50. In 2006, of the 25 who chose computer science, only three were women. In 2013, of the 50 or so who chose computer science as their concentration, 21 were women, a sevenfold increase. He's also made computer science and programming appealing and fun, as indicated, among other things, by the fact that some of his students made a parody of the famous or infamous, depending on your tastes and perspective, song, Call Me Maybe, called Take CS50. I'll, I'll spare you the rest of the lyrics. Uh, so I'm delighted that um, David has agreed to join us. Once David has finished speaking, as I, as I mentioned, uh, he will be interviewed by our very own Karen Brennan, who is going to uh, serve as the facilitator uh, this evening. Karen has been on the faculty for less than two years, but I think it's fair to say she's already a star. And her signature course is a course where students learn by doing, by creating. And by allowing students to create, she teaches them how others can learn by creating themselves. So they do not listen to lectures. Instead, they create games and stories and songs all related to education. And I had the good fortune last semester to sit in on the last day when all the students in the class made one minute presentations. You can imagine a, a, a very large class each making one minute presentations on what they had created. And it was incredibly inspiring. So she seems to have me yep. the perfect person to speak with David about, um, about his teaching. Uh, if you are looking ahead, our next master class will be on Thursday, April 1st in this room. Uh, again, at 4 p.m., we'll be joined by Jennifer Roberts, who is the Agassiz Professor of Humanities, a Harvard College professor, and the chair of the American um, Studies Program at Harvard. Uh, before I hand this over to David, I want to thank those who made tonight, uh, this afternoon's event possible. Matt Miller, Lori Forcier, and Jeff Perkins from HGSE. You should wave your hands. I think they deserve a round of applause. Uh, as well as David's teaching fellows, who I know were helpful to him. So um, a round of applause for them, too. <laughs> Uh, so, without further ado, David Mailer. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me today. It's an honor to be here for the first of these. Um, so, odds are, many of you in this room don't think of yourselves as computer people. But I would conjecture that you actually know more about computer science than you might think. In fact, one of the ways we typically start a semester, and in our intro course, CS50, is we pick up this thing here. Some of you might recognize what this is, although this is decreasingly the case these days. Um, do you mind, can we all lower the volume a bit on stage here? Um, so some of you might remember this, and of course, this is just a phone book with some thousands of names 
waves and numbers, and it might indeed have some thousand pages. Now, this sort of lends itself to an initial discussion of what we would call computational thinking or algorithmic thinking, more methodical, more careful thought processes that really characterizes computer science. Because indeed, even though it seems otherwise, computer science really isn't about programming, uh, even though that's what many students, particularly in middle school and high school, spend most of their time doing. It's more generally about problem solving and about careful, methodical, uh, efficient thinking. So for instance, if I were to seek out someone like Mike Smith in this phone book, if I wanted to look up his phone number, I could certainly start at the beginning, at page one, and then flip a page, and then flip a page, and then flip, <laughs> flip a page, and then flip a page. And this algorithm, this process, this program really that I as a human am executing is not at all incorrect. In fact, it's absolutely correct. It's just a little naive. It's a little simplistic. But it's correct because I will absolutely find Mike Smith eventually in this phone book. But of course, most anyone in this room would not do such a naive algorithm. What would most people in this room do just instinctively as humans? You sort of go roughly to the middle, and you might see in the middle, all right, this is not Mike Smith. I didn't get that lucky. I'm somewhere in the M's. But now I know something. This phone book is sorted from A to Z. And so I know that Mike is not going to be in this half of the phone book. And as we dramatically do every fall, I can literally rip the phone book in half, throw half of the problem away. And I'm fundamentally left with the same problem, but it's half the size. And I can, of course, do this again. So this time I'm going to go again, and I'm now in the T's. So I've gone slightly too far. But the takeaway now is that Mike is surely not to the right. So again, the problem has been halved in size. And I can do this again and again and again. And eventually, once I keep tearing this in half, I'll be left, hopefully, with just one page somewhere in the S's. And surely, if Mike Smith is in this phone book and not in this column, um, <laughs> I'll find his number. Now, how many steps did that take? Well, if we kind of do out the math, and this phone book had roughly 1,000 pages, I could split it in half and go to 500, then 250, then 125, dot, 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 and roughly 10 times could I do that process, splitting this problem in half. But what's powerful about this idea is that it's not just 10 steps in this case. More generally, it's a powerful approach. Because imagine if that phone book didn't have 1,000 pages, but say 4 billion pages. That's a heck of a phone book, but how many times could you tear a 4 billion page phone book in half? Anyone want to do that math? So if you kind of work it out, it's actually roughly 32. And there is sort of a powerful idea. You can take a massive phone book that, frankly, I can't even picture how big it would be, but with just 32 page tears, boom, we found Mike Smith. And so we can characterize this sort of instinctive thinking that most of us here have long had when walking the pages of a phone book as follows. A typical algorithm, my first instincts, was just turning a page one at a time. And I would argue that's a, a linear algorithm. If you add one more page, it takes me one more step to potentially find Mike. So we might plot that as follows. The x axis here is the size of the problem, so number of pages. And the y axis is how much time it might take to solve that problem. So one more page, one more step. One more page, one more step. Now, I could have been a little smarter. I could have have done things in twos and just kind of roughly done two, four, six, eight and flipped through the phone book that way, but that's not really fundamentally a better approach. What I did in the end, instinctively, by having the phone book and then having the phone book and again and again was fundamentally more powerful such that we would draw that chart like this. And it almost seems to become flat, which is to say if we went from 4 billion to 8 billion pages, an even more massive phone book, one more tear. No big deal. And these are the kinds of ideas that we begin to acquaint students in computer science with to get them thinking a little more cleverly and, frankly, leveraging ideas that might just be intuitive, but at the end of the day, characterize a field like computer science. And in fact, at this point, let me see if we can't do another demonstration of the same idea. If I wanted to take attendance here in this room, I could do it like my grade school teachers taught me and do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All right, there's already an obvious optimization. We can do 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, and so forth. That's twice as fast, so we're already at the yellow line. But I argue that I could probably be, get a little smarter at this, and I could probably have this problem again and again and again, but I need a little bit of help. So this is the awkward part, if you'll humor me. If everyone in the room could please stand up for just a moment and assign yourself the number one. So literally, if you are on the same page as everyone else, everyone in this room is the number one. So now things might get a little buggy. Pair off with someone standing, add your numbers together, and adopt the sum of those numbers as your own. So pair off with anyone standing, any one person standing. So a bit of a sanity check. If anyone does not currently have the number two in mind, you've done something wrong. 
except for one person if we have an odd number of people. But now step three, things get more interesting. Step three, one of you should sit down, the other should go back to step two. And if you would, repeat. Our computer seems to be slowing down here. Pair off with someone and again repeat. If you went back to step two, notice that it's induced a, a loop, a cycle of sorts, since you should now repair with someone who's still standing and then sum your two numbers again. And if we do this right, in just a moment there'll be one lone soul still standing. Everyone should be paired off. Mind you, the, the takeaway of this story is going to be just, wow, how much faster this approach clearly is. <laughs> Almost there. Almost there. I can help things along if it's getting hard to find someone. So if you're still standing, pair off with one other person still standing. All right, I can help things out here. I'll, I'll do the math myself. Okay, how, what number are you thinking of? 16, okay, plus 32, plus what number? 25, and someone else still standing? Plus 9 equals, oh damn it, I always do this. Two odd, no, well, uh, we'll get to debugging programs in just a moment. <laughs> Sorry, let's do it one last time, if you can say. 16 plus, 16 plus 32 plus 25 plus 9. So, according to this algorithm, you can now sit down. There are 82 people in a room that, according to my very naive grade school algorithm, had at least 96 people in it. So, that's not bad. This is our first demonstration of <laughs> A buggy algorithm, um, but why, we'll, co we'll consider for another day why that didn't quite work. So there's a bit of arithmetic errors, but I would argue that in theory, in theory, that should have gone much, much better for the following reason. So on each iteration of that loop, if you will, so we were kind of stuck in a loop, in, uh, an awkward social cycle there, where half of you were sitting down, then another half, then another half, until ideally one last person would be standing, though I helped things along arithmetically at the end. But fundamentally, I would argue that that should have been so much faster than my grade school approach, because indeed, on each iteration of that algorithm, half of you were sitting down. The problem was getting smaller and smaller and smaller by a factor of two again and again. So if indeed there were a thousand people in this room, that algorithm in theory should have just taken 10 such cycles of all of us sitting down half at a time. If there were four billion people in this room, most amazingly, that would have taken only 32 such rounds of sitting down. Now, of course, once you add some social friction and some arithmetic challenges and so forth, we don't necessarily get the optimal outcome. And indeed, we're sort of doing more than just one thing in each of those loops. So it's not a perfect comparison, but fundamentally, here's the takeaway. If the room suddenly doubled from 100 people or so to 200 people, that algorithm, in theory, would have taken just one more step. And that's the sort of idea we aspire generally in computer science to start leveraging. Now, something a bit more silly, if I can. We need a way to start expressing ourselves a little more methodically. Computers, of course, understand programming languages, but we're not going to dwell on what those are today, but rather the ideas underlying them. Let me go ahead and open up here um, just Microsoft Word, so we have something to type in for just a moment here. And if Karen, wouldn't you mind joining me here on stage? Um, how many people here know how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Okay, so you're about to convince me that that is in fact the case. So I went to, with this help of our team, shopping earlier today. We have here some ingredients. We have here some uh, loaf of bread. 
we have here a whole bunch of plates. And I fortunately have brought with us here, we've got some peanut butter uh, and some jelly and one knife. All right, so almost all of the hands in the room went up a moment ago claiming that you know how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but I would argue that in human reality, we don't necessarily always take care to express ourselves particularly carefully or methodically, and therein lies the potential for what are indeed called bugs. You make one errant mistake or you make one assumption as to what you're supposed to do or as to what the other person is supposed to do, and very quickly does your software start to behave incorrectly. Now hopefully that's not going to be the case here because this of course is such an easy thing, but what we'd, I'd like to do now is invite the audience to write a program with me here verbally. Karen, if she won't mind, will transcribe these steps just so we have a record of what's, uh, where things went wrong here or where things went quite right. And so how about step one? I have here my ingredients, bread, a plate, peanut butter, jelly, and a knife. Would someone like to offer up step one for Karen to transcribe and for me, the human computer, to execute? Yes, step one. Pick up the loaf of bread. <laughs> step two, one person per step. Open it. <laughs> I did exactly what you told me to do, but not necessarily the best way possible. So step three, lesson learned. Let's be more precise, more careful, more methodical. Step three. In the back. Set down the bag in your left hand on the table. Set down the bag in your left hand on the table. Yes. All right, progress. Good. Step four. Step four. Oh, yeah? Okay, remove two slices of bread from the bag in my right hand and place them on the table. Put these to the side. Okay? Yes, step, uh, step five. <laughs> oh, on the table. Okay. Step six. Put those two slices on the plate. Step uh, eight, seven. Step seven. Sorry. <laughs> Separate pieces of bread so that they're laying side by side. Eight. Um, Open the. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't type that. <laughs> Step eight. Would someone like to elaborate? Reach for the jar. <laughs> Very committal. <laughs> Step nine. Okay. Step nine. A ten. Okay, twist off cap and <laughs> step eleven. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, we're up to step twelve. <laughs> step twelve. Pick up the jelly. Okay, <laughs> bit of a loop. <laughs> step thirteen. Pick up the knife. Step 14. Put some jelly on knife. Okay. And put it on the bread. I'm sorry? Put the knife with the jelly on it on the bread. Better? 17. Spread the jelly. We're really not learning. <laughs> Step 18. It's going to be time for discussion soon. <laughs> Step 18. To grab a napkin. With, okay, we'll, we'll skip past this part. Step 19. I'm sorry? Oh. Repeat with the peanut Repeat with the peanut So now this is just becoming intentional, isn't it? All right, step 20. Almost there, please. Uh, 
Well played. <laughs> Step 20, almost there. I'm sorry? Clean hand with napkin, thank you. E extra credit. <laughs> Step 21, almost there. Nice, and oh, thank you, okay. All right, so thank you, and thank you to Karen. So surely an over the top demonstration, but it does sort of reveal, I'm not gonna be able to eat this at the same time. It does sort of reveal just sort of the assumptions or the carelessness with which a lot of us just typically think. And this just doesn't fly when it comes to programming, when it comes to computer science, and really STEM fields more generally when you need to express yourself ever so precisely to communicate correctly. Now, of course, how do we ultimately implement these kinds of things? We, of course, just did this verbally a moment ago, but you probably generally know, even if you're not a computer person per se, that underneath the hood of a computer somehow are zeros and ones. Now, how do we get from zeros and ones, though, to actually useful machines that do things for us? Well, it turns out that these zeros and ones are really just patterns, patterns that are understood by computers. If you've ever heard the slogan, uh, Intel inside, that means that inside of your computer is a CPU or central processing unit or brains of your computer made by a company called Intel. And that CPU understands certain patterns of zeros and ones, such that if you see a bunch of zeros and ones in a certain pattern, that might mean print something to the screen. If you see another pattern, that might mean add two numbers together, play a sound, play a movie, and so forth, though it's typically lower level than that. But how do we get from something like zeros and ones to actually useful information? Well, let me also look back to grade school here. So this is just the number in decimal form, 123. But why is it the number 123? You've probably not thought about this for quite some time, but recall perhaps that on the right-hand side we have the ones place, then we have the tens place, then we have the hundreds place, so powers of 10 more generally. And if I want to get from these three digits, one, two, three, to the sort of uh, uh, the con concept of 123, well, I just have to do a bit of math. 1 times 100, because there's a 1 in the hundreds place, plus 2 times 10, because there's a 2 in the tens place, plus 3 times 1, because there's a 3 in the ones place. And that, of course, gives me, ultimately, 100 plus 20 plus 3, which is the number we ultimately know as 123. Now, you're about to become all the more computer people, because, indeed, binary, the system in which computers think, is fundamentally the same thing as you've known all of your life, except instead of powers of 10, we use powers of 2 for each of those columns. On the right, we have the 1's place. In the middle, we have not the 10's place now, but the 2's place. And on the left, we have the 4's place. And if we kept going, we'd had 8's and 16's and 32's and so forth. But at the end of the day, binary just uses fewer digits, 0 and 1 only, rather than actually using what zero through nine in the decimal system like we do. Now, how do you get from just zeros and ones to useful information? How do we build back up so we can solve problems like executing things like this? Well, here's how we might represent the number one in the binary system. So we have three bits here, as I'm gonna call them, binary digits. And the fact that there's leading zeros, just like in our normal decimal world, doesn't matter. You can say zero, one, two, three, that's still the number 123. So zero, zero, one is just the number one. Now, how do I represent the number two? And if you've never thought about this or seen binary before, you can probably guess what comes next. What would be the pattern of bits that represents the number we humans know as number two? Yeah, just zero, one, zero. And of course, if we want to get a three, I have to add another one to there. So I'm going to change the rightmost zero to a one. Now things get a little more interesting. How do I represent the number four? Well, I just need a one in the fours place, and then zero, zero. Now, how do we go from this sort of pictorial representation to something a computer understands? Well, if I put these things aside and bring up these guys here, one of the examples we typically do in, in CS50, actually, is to start toggling switches. So here are some very simple desk lamps, and they sort of represent the presence or the absence of electricity flowing through the light bulbs that are in here. So if I want to represent the number zero, Done. This is the number zero as embodied by these little electronic devices. Of course, if I now toggle this one, now I'm representing the number one. And if I toggle this off and this one, now I'm counting up to one, or sorry, two. And now I've got three. And of course, if I toggle this further, I have four. If I turn all of these on, I have seven, because four is place, plus two is place, plus one's place. And so that's all we need to do to represent 
numbers in a binary system, but of course that's not quite enough for a computer as we know it. I want to expect graphics and sounds and emails and programs. Well, we can get there, right? I would argue that if we want to represent even the simplest of pictures, right, of the simple smiley face here represented as a grid of dots, otherwise known as pixels, well, if we have a way of expressing the notion of on or off, one or zero, true or false, think of it however you'd like, I could represent this smiley face with just a pattern of light bulbs, really, more than I have here, but that are on if I want to represent a one or a white dot, and that are off if I instead want to represent a black dot. And together they compose a smiley face here. So we can surely represent graphics, but how do we actually do even more than that? Well, ultimately we want to store this information somewhere, store it somewhere on disk. And even though technologies are changing over time, at the end of the day we're still using various technologies to store zeros and ones. You might remember this guy. Might have been a while. So this too is a hard thing to find these days, but eBay has quite a few left. So this is Wooly Wooly, and these are just little magnetic particles. And it turns out he's nicely representative of how you might actually store information inside of a computer if you have something that has polar opposites. A magnetic particle that if it's north-south could represent a one, and if it's south-north could represent a zero. So not unlike the tiny little particles here. So it turns out that inside of your own hard drives, inside of your own computers, are exactly little magnetic particles like that. And as soon as you have one means of representing a zero or a one, and then you have hundreds or thousands or millions of these pixels, you can, of these little magnetic particles, you can begin to represent, of course, not just seven, but much, much larger numbers, much, much larger That's graphics. So how does this all work? Well, let's take a look underneath the hood here, and we're going to peel back the layers in this following uh, few second video of what's going on inside of a computer's hard drive. The hard drive is where your PC stores most of its permanent data. To do that, the data travels from RAM along with software signals that tell the hard drive how to store that data. The hard drive circuits translate those signals into voltage fluctuations. These in turn control the hard drive's moving parts, some of the few moving parts left in the modern computer. Some of the signals control a motor which spins metal coated platters. Your data is actually stored on these platters. Other signals move the read-write heads to read or write data on the platters. This machinery is so precise that a human hair couldn't even pass between the heads and spinning platters. Yet it all works at terrific speeds. So, so small that you can't even see it on these platters, but if I now advance the slide, we'll actually see at a lower level exactly how we get from these black little magnetic particles to a representation of numbers and in turn things like graphics. Let's look at what we just saw in slow motion. When a brief pulse of electricity is sent to the read-write head, it flips on a tiny electromagnet for a fraction of a second. The magnet creates a field which changes the polarity of a tiny, tiny portion of the metal particles which coat each platter's surface. A patterned series of these tiny charged up areas on the disk represents a single bit of data in the binary number system used by computers. Now if the current is sent one way through the read-write head, the area is polarized in one direction. If the current is sent in the opposite direction, the polarization is reversed. How do you get data off the hard disk? Just reverse the process. So it's the particles on the disk that get the current in the read-write head moving. Put together millions of these magnetized segments and you've got a file. Now, the pieces of a single file may be scattered all over a drive's platters. Kind of like the mess of papers on your desk. So a special extra file keeps track of where everything is. Don't you wish you had something like that? So when you came in, you might have grabbed one of these from yesteryear. If not, feel free to grab one in just a moment. I'll pass some of these around. These are, of course, floppy disks. Um, we'd like to pass those around. Um, anyone recall how many zeros and ones, how many magnetic particles you can store in these things? 52,000. What, what unit? Or, sorry? 44,000, so actually uh, quite yesteryear, like the most recent incarnations of these actually might have one, the ability to represent 1.4 million bytes or 1.4 megabytes. So imagine you can't even fit, for instance, a, a, an audio file, an MP3 on a single one of these floppy disks, but the technology inside of these things is actually almost identical to a more expensive, larger, faster hard drive. In fact, for those of you who have these in hand, take a look carefully with the metal cover here and just move it aside. And what do you see? What's inside of there? 
So some kind of disk, so some kind of floppy disk. In fact, we're about to ruin whatever's on these disks, but if you push your finger on that, therein lies the so-called floppy disk. Now this plastic shell around it is really just keeping it safe, so why don't we actually go one level deeper um, and do uh, protect your eyes when you do this, because there's a little spring that might hit you or your neighbor, and just break off that metal faceplate that's covering the so-called floppy disk. And now you're going to see just how cheaply made and yet how fundamentally important these have been for storing data. If you go ahead on the bottom, you'll see that the plastic starts to separate. Jam your thumbs or other fingers in there and just peel the two sides of the disk apart. And you'll see very, very few pieces. A little bit of felt, some more plastic, and then ultimately a truly floppy disk. What we just saw in the video was a harder platter, typically made of metal and not this very floppy surface, but these is, this is where floppy disks got their name. Now, of course, every time I do something like this, I'm literally wiping bits and therefore data and any files that I might have once had on these floppies, but that's all that's ever been inside of this. It really is that fragile and yet capable of storing that many little magnetic particles. Of course, we haven't really done anything interesting with any of this data. It's one thing to count up to seven. It's one thing to represent a black and white smiley face, but how do we actually build up letters and numbers and the ability to write essays and emails and instant messages and the like? Well, for that, we need some kind of encoding system. We need to somehow build on top of these basic fundamentals like zeros and ones and ultimately integers and get to more expressive means of representing information. Um, so I could do this alone, but I think it'd be a lot more fun if we do this together as follows. Here is something known as ASCII, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, which is just a fancy way of saying here is a very common mapping between numbers, integers, and letters. So in other words, a typical Mac or PC to this day will represent the capital letter A simply by storing the integer 65. How might it do that? Well, it just needs more light bulbs, more desk lamps than this, or really transistors, much smaller incarnations of this same idea that are either switched on or switched off. So it just needs a few more of those toggle switches to represent a number as big as 65 or a number as big as 90, which apparently is the capital letter Z. Suffice it to say, there are other numbers that represent exclamation points and uh, hashtags and other such symbols that you might have on your keyboard. But how might I now actually represent information? I need more than just three bits. I really need a more common base system um, with eight bits, a byte, if you will. If you've ever wondered what a byte is, it's just eight bits. It's eight desk lamps side by side, would be a byte's worth of desk lamps. So I have eight pieces of paper in my hand here. This is the other audience participation opportunity. Um, it won't involve any of this, but if uh, I could get eight volunteers to join me up on stage and take a bit of the, the pressure off here. Who would like to be literally number one? <laughs> OK, that was a fast hand. Come on up. And who would like to be number two? Come on up. Number four? Come on up. Number eight, 16, 32, 64, and 128, please. We need eight volunteers. First, first folks to come on up. We'll take on this value. Absolutely. Number eight. Number 16. All right, and if in the meantime you want to line yourself up exactly as we would have earlier, so the ones place will be all the way on the right, and the 128's place is going to be all the way over here, 32's, 32's, 32's. We're not going to be able to spell anything out if we don't get three more volunteers. All right, 64's, all right, excellent. And lastly, the highest ordered bit, as we say, 128. Come on down. Thank you so much. All right. So we have a byte's worth of humans here. So you can think of each of these kind folks as, as a desk lamp or as a transistor or just any sort of physical incarnation of something that can have an on state or an off state, a true state or a false state. And if you'll um, humor me here, in just a moment, we're going to spell something out for everyone. And if your hand is up, let's assume that they're representing a one. And if your hand is down by your side, you're just a zero. On the backs of their pieces of paper, they each have a little cheat sheet that tells them what to do for three separate rounds of the following algorithm. So if you would all kindly spell out your first letter by raising or not raising your hand based on what your sheet is telling you to do. All right, so we have now two hands up, and would the audience like to convert this integer to an ASCII character? B. B. Why is that? Well, we have a 1 in the 64's place, so 1 times 64. We have a 1 in the 2's place, so that's plus 2. 64 plus 2 is, of course, 66, which gives us the letter B.
Excellent. All right, everyone can put their hands down. And round two, if you would, spell out your next letter. All right. What letter do we have being spelled out here now? Okay, O, oh, why is that? Well, we have a 64 and an 8 and a 4 and a 2 and a 1, which is ultimately going to give us 79, which is, of course is O. So we now have two letters spelled out, B followed by O followed by, if you would, last round. Raise or not raise your hand, please. We have 64, 16, a 4, a 2, and a 1, with the last letter being then? W, w which spells out their final instruction. Bow, if you would. Thank you very much to our Bite volunteers. Thank you. You can hang on. You can hang on. Thank you so much. So we built up then from this very basic primitive, right, electricity either being on or off to representing numbers. Now we've seen how you might represent something like an image by having a black dot or a white dot. Now we can express ourselves with letters of the alphabet. And indeed, there are even more numbers and more letters that we can represent, not just for uh, English letters here, but for Asian languages and even symbols that you can't normally type on, say, a US keyboard. All of those ultimately have mappings that computers ultimately understand. But even that isn't quite enough to start telling the computer to do things logically. We as humans need to somehow program these devices using not the sort of pseudocode that Karen was transcribing as folks were offering up instructions. We need something that's a little more consistent and a little more standard like this. So this truly probably looks like Greek to some folks in this room, but this is perhaps one of the simplest computer programs you can write in a language known as C. Now there's dozens, if not hundreds, of programming languages out there. Why? People have different preferences, different languages let you do different things more easily or with greater difficulty, but this is representative of a very common approach to writing a program in something called source code. So it's sort of English-like syntax that absolutely looks cryptic and has some weird syntax to it, but it's all characters you could type at the keyboard. And you could use something like Microsoft Word or TextEdit or Notepad to type something like this out. But what you ultimately need is a computer program, often known as a compiler, if you've heard the phrase, to convert these English-like words to zeros and ones, because that's what Intel inside ultimately understands. Well, we can actually see this in action. How do I go from this, for instance, to this, so these zeros and ones are truly what is outputted when we convert that so-called source code in that language C to something my actual computer, my Mac or my PC, ultimately understands. And we can see this in action. I'm going to open up a simple program, it's really just a black and white window, and I'm going to go ahead and open a simple text editor, and I'm going to open a file called hello.c. And I'll go ahead and type this all out anew, just so that it's, uh, there's no magic here. This is just a super simple text file, and I'm going to transcribe exactly what was on the board a moment ago. We'll defer for another day exactly what each of these lines does, but you can probably guess, even if you're by no means a programmer, what this program's probably going to do. When I run this program by double-clicking or typing a command, what's probably going to happen in just a moment? Say hello world. I don't quite know what printf is, but it sounds like print, and hello world looks like a sentence that's going to be printed. And sure enough, let me go ahead and save this. I'm going to go ahead and run a program called GCC, which is a fairly arcane program that converts source code, like I just typed, into binary zeros and ones, otherwise known as object code. And if I now run this program, I could double click in other contexts, but here I'm just going to run a super simple command, a.out, enter. There is hello world. So certainly not all that impressive, but we can do more powerful things for sure. In fact, for instance, let me go ahead and show you one other program here. This was written in advance, and we have here the following. This is written by someone else. This is not normal source code. Normal humor, humans, programmers, do not write code like this. This is an example of something known as an obfuscated C contest. Uh, it's an example of writing code with the specific intention of which is to write code that no one else in the world can understand because it looks a little something like this. But the net effect of this contest, which is essentially held annually and folks compete to sort of create seemingly magical programs, ultimately allows me to write a program that might do something like this. So still, still super simple um, at first glance, but can very powerfully start to loop, can start to repeat patterns, can start to use different characters, and it's frankly a little mesmerizing after a while. And all of that derives from having built on top of the simplest of constructs at the end of the day, which are just 
those zeros and ones. And if we fast forward now, and before we sort of lose everyone in the room to this thing, if we fast forward now and you assume that you can continue to build on top of these principles, and indeed this is a common theme of computer science, this abstraction and layering more and more complexity upon work that you or others have already done in the past, we can surely make more powerful things. And in conclusion, what I'd like to do is share this clip with you that frankly is ultimately an advertisement, but it's a story about a young five-year-old in India who lost his way, fell asleep on a train, um, and ultimately lost track of his family and hometown. Um, fast forward several years ago, and you'll see this story unfold. It was 26 years ago, and I was just about to turn five. We got to the train station, and we boarded my train together. My brother just said, I'll stay here, and I'll come back. And I just thought, well, you know, I might as well just go to sleep and just wake me up. And when I wake up the next day, the whole carriage was empty on a runaway train, a ghost train taking me I don't know where. I was adopted out to Australia to a Australian family. And mum had decorated my room with the map of India, which she put next to my bedside. I woke up every morning to see that map. And hence, it sort of kept the memories alive. People would say, you're trying to find a needle in a haystack, so you never find it. You know, I'd, I'd have flashes of the places that I used to go, the flashes of my family faces. There was the image of my mother sitting down with her legs crossed, just watching her cry. Life is just so hard. That was my treasure. And I was looking at Google Map, realised there's Google Earth as well, a world where you could zoom into. I started to have all these thoughts and what possibilities that this could do for me. I said to myself, well, you know, you've got all the photographic memories and landmarks where you're from and you know what the town looks like. This could be an application that you can use to find your way back. I thought well, I'll put a, a dot on Calcutta train station uh, in a radius line that, you know, you should be searching around this area. I sort of came across these train tracks and I started following it and I came to a train station which reflected the same image that was in my memories. Everything matched. I just thought, yep, yeah, I know where I'm going. I'm just going to let the map that I had in my head to lead me and take me back to my hometown. I came to the doorstep uh, of the house that I was born and walked around about 15 metres around the corner. There was three ladies standing outside adjacent to each other. And the middle one stepped forward and I just thought, this is your mother. She came forward, she hugged me, and, uh, and you know, we were there for about five minutes. She grabbed my hand and she took me to the house and, and got on the phone. They shouldn't ring my sister and my brother to say that, you know, your brother has just all of a sudden appeared like a ghost. And then the family was reunited again. Everything's all good. They help my mother out. She doesn't have to be slaving away. She can live the rest of her life in peace. It was a needle in a haystack, but the needle was there. Everything's there. Everything we have in the world is the tap of a button, but you've got to have the will and the determination to wanting it. Even then, if you don't think of yourself now as a computer person, realize that simply by layering on top one of these ideas after the other and the other, and even just say a few months of taking a class or, or tinkering on your own in front of that computer that you might now be taking for granted, you can truly make um, very increasingly powerful things. Um, so I thought I'd leave us with that somewhat somber but heartwarming note as we perhaps proceed to a chat. Thank you so much for having me. start with some conversations with your neighbor. So maybe something you noticed, something that surprised you, and a question you have. And then we'll open up to a larger group discussion, but maybe just like three or four minutes with your neighbor, something you noticed, something that surprised you, maybe a question you have. Okay? And then we'll come back together as a whole group. To call the bread came as a surprise. <laughs> <laughs>
Pardon the mess we made. <laughs> back as a whole group. It's always hard to interrupt lively conversation. So I asked you to think about something you noticed, something surprising, something, maybe a question you had. I actually thought maybe we'd open it up by turning that over to David. So what is something you noticed, <laughs> something that was surprising, and maybe a question you either had for yourself or for the group? The hardest thing for me whenever we talk about some of these concepts is not quite knowing the audience and how comfortable folks are or how uncomfortable they are with technology. So I'll admit I, I rely quite a bit on, on head nods and people sort of getting it or not getting it depending on where we might steer the conversation. 
And for me, I wasn't sure we were gonna do the peanut butter and jelly until the last minute. I wasn't sure I could bring myself to do it in, in front of you kind folks. But hopefully it was well received. And it is demonstrative of what we try to teach in introductory computer science, which is how to express yourself more carefully, more methodically. And it's actually not even a derivative of computer science itself. My fifth grade uh, teacher used that same example years ago to teach us how to just write more clear sentences. So we borrowed it for other purposes. So as you, I'm gonna ask you another question, but if, as people have questions, there are microphones at the front, so if you wanna come up and ask questions, please, please do. So was there anything that did not work the way you anticipated this afternoon? Good question. The self-counting, where everyone stands up and half the folks <laughs> sit down. It actually, it almost always goes that way. In seven years of doing this in various contexts, I don't think we've ever gotten an accurate count, which is great, because then we can always make the joke, how many Harvard students does it take to dot, 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 do this? And it's always fewer or more than are actually in the room each time. So that worked out well um, this time. So um, that was sort of a good failure in that sense. Um, we. I drew sort of highlights from CS50 in particular. Most of that material is not sort of jammed into one class, but is woven throughout this whole semester. So for me, it's hard to weave all of that, I think, into a concise narrative when we otherwise had weeks to do. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not thrilled with how I ended that a moment ago, because I'm not quite sure we sent the message that I hoped to, which is more about the takeaways being that computer science is about computational thinking. It's about, uh, about more careful thinking and really this layering idea, taking very simple primitives that all of us can understand these desk lamps. And from that, if you just take these baby steps, you very quickly get all the way to the end game, which is something like Google Maps and some seemingly some very sophisticated piece of software. But at the end of the day, is really built on these very simple primitives. Mm -hmm. Surprises, questions from the, this is not a shy or quiet group, so. <laughs> What the, I was, I was wondering what the whole bit stuff, why that was relevant to teasing, teaching us com computational thinking. I thought it was a, I thought the whole bit thing and the whole sort of a sorting and, and uh, searching stuff were two very, very different things. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that was pretty strange, especially that as a, a programmer, I never, unless I'm doing incredibly low level things, the, the fact that the data is represented in bits is totally abstracted away from me. And that's actually the key word. If I can steal your own, uh, phrasing of it, abstraction, is actually this key principle of computer science, actually, and I described it a moment ago more, is layering, where it's, it certainly is, certainly to something at the level of a Google application or even the Hello World application I whipped up quickly, completely immaterial how data is ultimately represented, but it's representative of this sort of black, bo block, uh, back, uh, black box approach that's so commonly used in programming and computer science more generally, where you take an idea, and there actually are some interesting complex implementation details, but you can treat it ultimately as a black box and just take completely for granted that you can represent an integer. After you understand ASCII, you can completely take for granted that you can represent a character. After you have that, you can completely take for granted that you can represent a whole paragraph of text. And or so eventually, program. or a program ultimately. So increasingly, you just take all of these things for granted, and that's why we typically introduce that basic primitive, so so that you, that students have this ground up understanding of what's going on and take nothing for granted, even if on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't need to leverage those principles. Okay, that's interesting, yeah. I thought it was a bit disconnected from the rest, but yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Hi, David. Um, I took a year off to teach AP Computer Science at a local high school, and it was really disenchanted because I thought it was teaching to the test, that students didn't have enough time, I felt, to do hands-on laboratory, project-based learning. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. And is your, your course commensurate with like an AP course? Or what can we do to reform AP computer science to make it more engaging? It's a good question. The AP curriculum that currently exists really is not very good or very exciting for students. And at the end of the day, it really is more about, in most incarnations, teaching students Java and this feature of Java and this other feature of Java. And frankly, I think the best solution to that is something that's in the works already. There will soon be an alternative AP Computer Science uh, course called AP Computer Science Principles. It's not going to debut till 2015 or 2016, but it's much more based on the kinds of topics that we touched on here today, and there's still an aspect of programming to it. It's gonna be a, a studio course, and so one of the reasons for the long trajectory is that the College Board is currently figuring out how to actually accept 
projects from students and not standardized tests from students. And so I think this is actually a wonderfully exciting solution to the problem. Well, Jim, I'm glad to hear because I also t uh, I also graded AP exams for a number of years. I fly down to Clemson once a year, mm. and I learned from that experience it has the lowest pass rate of the APs, and it actually ends up being a disincentive for people for kids to end up majoring in computer science. Absolutely, and at the college level, that's one of the things we fight against is these preconceived notions and these initial impressions that a lot of students have of what computer science is. Um, so that's one of the biggest challenges for us, is sort of helping students see the, the forest for the trees once they get here. Well, thank you. Um, so I noticed that uh, you had some audience participation. You had us actually, some of us, actually becoming bits, mm -hmm. embodying almost these, these things that we can't really see or feel. I wondered um, whether that was intentional uh, to sort of, I don't know, uh, how, how intentional was that? Completely. Uh, for me, these kinds of times together in lectures more generally, I think the greatest opportunity they afford a class is for memorable moments. Um, I'm not nearly as convinced that you would understand how you, could, how you would remember to how you would represent a four or a seven or binary more generally, but I think it's safe to say for at least a few days, most people in this room will remember the sort of faces or awkwardly standing eight people at the front of the room <laughs> holding or not holding paper up or down, and that's the idea that's meant to stick, so that we take fairly arcane topics, fairly dry topics that are tough to get excited about, but conflate them with visuals and memories that students have so that they have a mental model to fall back on that's far more compelling, I think, than like a black and white slide. change them depending on what the context of your class is, be it a small group setting, a large group setting, or a MOOC setting? It's a really good question. And the peanut butter and jelly example is sort of representative of decisions that I at least tend to make. Like I felt we had critical mass in a room where something like that could go over well if it were just 12 of us or 20 of us. Frankly, I think it'd be completely awkward for me to be making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches if it's just a small group for which really more intimate discussion I think is more appropriate. So it's actually easier to do things in these visuals when we have 700 students in Sanders Theater because there's an energy that you can sort of build on and um, there's always then the fact that some, everyone knows at least someone on stage. So there's that sort of familial aspect to it. Um, but for me, I've been increasingly, especially since CS50 and all of my courses at Harvard Extension School since 1999 have been available online, I've been increasingly questioning pedagogically what the role of lecture should be. Because it's certainly not the best use of people's time to just sit passively in seats and have someone like me talk at them. Um, I think that can be done to the extent it needs to be done for the delivery of information much more effectively offline or online really uh, in the form of video where you could fast forward, rewind, read a transcript, command F and search for something You navigate the materials at your own pace because surely in an hour, hour and a half lecture it's so easy for me at least to sort of zone out for a moment and then you're lost for the rest of the class and if that's surely happening on a non-trivial scale with 700 students. So the times that we have together in Sanders these days, um, we've scaled back. Lectures used to be 90 minutes for CS50. We deliberately scaled them back to 60. And it was actually a very healthy exercise for me this past year because I realized, you know what? We don't need to do seven examples as a class in lecture. We can do three, and then we can defer the others to a much more comfortable situation online for students after the fact. And it's really forced me to think about the best way we can create those memorable moments. And so what's changed in my classes over the years is as I see other faculty here at other universities doing just really like smart or clever or innovative things, whether it was as far back as fifth grade, trying to weave those kinds of things in because I think the value of being in person is the memories you have, the energy that you feel that you can't quite convey if you just have a laptop open at home. You, just to follow up on that, how do you convey that in your MOOC setting? Vicar vicariously, as creating an environment via which the CS50X students online can live vicariously through the students in Sanders. And we do that as Ramon here is standing facing you all with the camera, weaving into the final product of the video um, glimpses of students in the class. So you sort of have someone with whom you can empathize. 
Um, we do, you might have seen earlier as you came in, we do a lot of aerial photography on campus now to give people a taste of like Harvard and not just make it a human like me in front of a black and white background, but part of a community and try to give people a sense of what it would be like if they could physically or could financially come to a place like this um, and participate online. So we try to capture as much of the, the character and the culture of the class as we can, including things like lunches with students. Can I actually build on her question? So that's partly about building connectedness from the students to you, but what about the other direction? How do you feel connected to 700 students in Sanders or to hundreds of thousands of students online? It's a good question. It's not in lectures per se. I think it's increasingly for CS50X through the online communities. We actually uh, gave up using more traditional forums for edX, and we actually use a very popular website called Reddit, if familiar. We actually use Facebook, neither of which are great pedagogical tools or great um, logistical tools for thousands of students truly participating, but they have this, as a friend described it to me, this, this lower transactional distance between you and the class, such that students and myself are on Facebook way too much, and the fact that you can tag someone, and the fact that you can loop someone into a conversation has really facilitated, I think, connections between me, between the teaching fellows, and the students online. And then for students on campus in a 700 student course, we actually do a lot of social activities. We just recently went to MIT to go ice skating together, me and some of the teaching staff, and we do weekly lunches on Fridays with students where we take 30 or 40 students to fire an ice in the square just to have casual chit chat and to ideally make a big class feel much smaller. So there's a huge experiential and cultural aspect to this class in particular that I think we spend a lot of, a disproportionate amount of time on. That's good. Okay, thank you. Um, I work with kids in Latin America, in Colombia in particular, um, uh, uh, teaching kids how to code. It began, you know, in that big bucket of coding, mm -hmm. uh, but then think about, you know, computational thinking, algorithmical thinking. Uh, so it's not about coding, it's about thinking in a particular way. Uh, and we were using Scratch and, and, and App Inventor for these efforts. Um, and now we're looking into, for example, things like uh, Code HS, where, where you formalize computational thinking through a, a, a programming language. Mm -hmm. Um, and, 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 and we're debating a lot, I mean, w w how does that transition should happen? Is it for everybody? Uh, is, it, is it not teaching kids, kids how to code? Is teaching everybody how to think algorithmically? Uh, and then some might go, go ahead and formalize it with a computer, uh, you know, learning a computer language. Sort of a little bit like the relationship between physics and, and formalizing physics with the mathematical language, you know, so, so teaching physics in, in preschool, um, it's, it's, it's total, totally viable uh, as long as you don't, you don't get tangled up trying to formalize it with mathematics, which is a little bit what could happen between the relationship of, uh, between uh, algorithm, uh, algorithmical thinking and a computer, uh, uh, a programming language. So uh, I don't know, what's, what's your take on, on, on that relationship between those two things? Sure. The thought that comes to mind is that I think the best approach, I think, is to spend far less time on programming, per se, on the choice of language, per se, and much more on the, the fundamentals. Um, so topics we didn't discuss really today are particular algorithms, ways that you can um, sort the phone book in advance, like Verizon or um, the telco companies actually do. That in and of itself is an interesting problem that completely transcends the choice of language you might use, C, in the case I did. So what we do, for instance, in CS50, we use Scratch for the very first week. We then use this language C for several weeks. We then transition to another one called PHP and JavaScript in the context of HTML and CSS. And so students really get this fire hose approach to languages, but it's really to send the message that you did not just spend three months learning C. You learned how to program more generally, and you learned, ideally, how to think more methodically. And what's really powerful, I think, about that approach of not sort of focusing on programming in a language is that we're truly like wowed at the end of the semester. We have the CS50 Fair, which is an exhibition of final projects, and it's truly astonishing to me personally every year to the extent to which so many students go off and implement something that we did absolutely not teach them in the class. Wasn't on the syllabus, wasn't in a lecture, wasn't in a section. And I think that's testament to students' own abilities um, to bootstrap themselves after being given some of those initial ingredients. Hi, David. My name is Mark Johnson, and I'm actually a student in CS50X. And I wonder if you can talk to us about kind of the transition that you made from um, from being a student in CS50 to that of actually teaching it, and in particular, whether you can share with us some of the principles or values that really guide or guided the development of, of your course and that continue to guide it kind of as you iterate it uh, from year to year. 
Sure, I would say I did take CS50 myself in 1996. The story I tell in CS50 is that I was a government concentrator at the time and CS50 um, has always had a close place in my heart because it truly changed my path in life. But when I was fortunate enough to start teaching it, it wasn't so much my experience taking it that influenced it. It was really the experience that others had uh, had while taking it, the reputation that the course had, which was always a positive reputation, but always a sort of beast of reputation. A course, like computer science more generally for a lot of people, to beware. And so my number one goal when I inherited the reins in 2007 was to really try to turn that reputation on its head and to make the course much friendlier to students that we describe euphemistically as those less comfortable. You sort of know if you are, you're, you're uncertain about even being in the class in the first week. And not to chip away at the workload, not to chip away at the difficulty, but to really just change the tone of the course and and in case in point, we introduced Scratch in 2007 for the very first time. And the statistic I often share is that whereas in 2006 our retention rate uh, was during shopping week was about 67 percent. 67 of the percent of the students who came the first day came back the next week. It went up to 98 percent in 2007. And I'm sure that was a large result of our having sent the message of Scratch, not for the whole semester. We didn't start teaching Scratch. We still used it for just one week, but we really did change the tone of the course. And we went to great lengths to build out a support structure over the past seven years in terms of manpower, in terms of resources online for students to really ensure that it's an environment in which all students can succeed completely irrespective of prior background or comfort. Um, I have two questions to ask. First is, there are many ways to teach computer science, but you chose a particular way. So what are some of your design principles behind your pedagogy? And the second question is, so nowadays there are lots of online courses, but the discussion forum part seems to be a mess for most of them. Do you have any insight or suggestion on how can we improve that part? Good questions. Um, so with the design philosophy, I think all of my classes, 50 among them, are characterized by a significant amount of work. Um, and it's perhaps selfish of me to sort of want as a teacher for students to spend a disproportionate amount of their time in a given semester with us. But frankly, from my own experience in college and even before, it was those courses that really pushed me and really expected almost too much of me, such that I really had to put in the time um, that I felt in retrospect that I got the most out of. And some of the hardest classes that I might have even hated or thought I hated at the time have had such a lasting effect on me that while we try to avoid the hatred aspect of that, <laughs> um, certainly the workload is one of the primary goals of CS50 so that we're not just doing back of the chapter uh, type questions that you might see in a typical textbook. We really are having from week zero on through week 12 students building non-trivial projects that just get larger and larger and hopefully more interesting and more challenging. So I think very high expectations coupled with, I hope, a sense of playfulness or ridiculousness that I think we can get away with because we are, do expect so much of students that I think a lot of the, so of two ideas, the, the spoonful of sugar uh, idea and also sort of working hard and playing hard and creating an environment where we can expect a lot of students but we try to also create an environment that they, they like being there with us. As for the discussion for uh, it's, it's hard. The biggest har challenge, I think, is just the, the noise to signal ratio or vice versa, um, the sheer number of people that are participating. Um, we use Reddit, Facebook, and even Twitter to some extent because people are already there, and it's actually increased, I think, participation quite a bit, even though the tools are suboptimal. And I'm also not a fan of walled gardens. Like, I want the questions students have asked to outlive CS50X this year. I don't want the database to be deleted and prepared for a new semester. I'd much rather have a longevity to it. Um, and we gain that by using these open tools, these third-party tools, as opposed to our own little course website. Thank you. Thank you for your very animated presentation. Um, I, I was born and grew up in Malaysia, and I came to the United States actually to study computer science. Um, but because that was the first time I was exposed to programming, I thought it was very difficult for me to catch up with my classmates who have been programming probably for a decade before. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, um, the first is perhaps when did you start started programming? and um, do you have a, since programming is also like a language, what age range do you think is best to begin exposing children to computational thinking? Um, and then the second question I had is, you mentioned MOOCs and the project-based learning, um, but for um, children in developing countries, what combination of things do that may be their best bet in some sense to get um, these computational um, thinking basics um, um, fully mastered? 
Sure, in, in reverse order, um, I actually am a huge fan of Scratch and what Karen and Mitchell Resnick and John Maloney and others at MIT have done with that and derivatives that have since cropped up because it, uh, for those unfamiliar, Scratch is this graphical programming language. You drag and drop, th drop things that look like puzzle pieces and they snap together visually if it makes logical sense to do so and you can make a cat or other characters move up, down, left, right and do things on the screen. It's a programming language and we do use it in an introductory college level computer science course because it introduces students to constructs like loops and conditions and variables and booleans and functions now um, and quite a few other ideas as well. And even though we in CS50 in the first week don't have to use that terminology, um, you certainly don't have to use it with students say ages six and up. The ideas I think are ultimately very intuitive to students and it's a wonderful stepping stone to then a more traditional language like C or Python or Ruby or PHP these days. And so I don't quite know what the lower bound is. I would say it's quite up to the students, but I would not think twice at all about putting Scratch in front of a six-year-old child as opposed to a video game because they can then create their own video games with it. And I think once they get a taste for and a comfort with the basic ideas, then can you begin to layer on top of that some of the formalities? Can you talk to them about you know, how could you do that better? How could you do that more efficiently? Um, so I think it's never too soon to start. Um, and in terms of my own experience, it was very limited. In the three buckets we have in CS50, students less comfortable, more comfortable, and somewhere in between. I was probably in between in 1996. I had written like a, a tic-tac-toe program at some summer thing years ago, um, a programming language called Logo. And I owned a Star Wars book with C-3PO and R2-D2 on the cover that to this day I hate because it so turned me off to programming because the programs inside of it that were meant to be transcribed by the reader were written, as I recall, in a non-monospaced font, which meant that you couldn't tease apart. Is, should there be a space there? Should there be a semicolon there? All the stupid things, but that actually matter to programming. And I still remember to this day, I must have been eight, 10 years old, I didn't understand what I was doing and it wasn't sufficient to just type and transcribe. So that experience alone really kind of, I think, stunted my interest for a while, so much so that I thought my friends in high school were complete geeks for wanting to do programming or computer science. And it wasn't until I got to campus and sort of got up the nerve to shop CS50 the first week, and even then only pass fail what would give me enough nerve to do it, um, did I realize that I actually had a passion for it. Thanks, David. A um, hundred years ago, people used to be taught Latin uh, because it, it was supposed to better their mind in some general way. William James, in I think his only true experiment, basically debunked the so-called doctrine of formal discipline, which was that. And there's been a lot of work on expertise since then, showing that it's very domain-specific. Chess players aren't better at checkers, and vice versa. So when I hear you uh, talk about bettering the mind in the form of algorithmic thinking, some of my alarm bells as a psychologist or an educational researcher go off. So I guess, are you making the claim that your class teaches people how to think about something that has some content other than computer science? And if so, make, make that, how, how do you make that claim very strongly with some recognition of the past claims along those lines of sort of generally making people smarter? That's a good question. Um, so we set out in CS50 in particular to give people not only sort of a new way of thinking, more methodical thinking, but also tools for their toolkit. And indeed, CS50 is a terminal class consistently for 20 years for at least half of the students in the class. They'll never again take a computer science course. So it's definitely not our goal to turn people into computer scientists, but to really do two things, empower them to take some of these very practical skills and this sort of mental model back to their own fields. One that always comes to mind is um, we've had students in the past who are pre-med and who are working with an MD at one of Harvard's hospitals and they have very large data sets and they previously were stuck with tools like Excel or maybe MATLAB but typically tools like Excel and very really graphical things that you can only do so much with. And there's just such an empowerment, I think, with just a little bit of computer science under one's belt and programming specifically, so that you can then go back and solve very domain-specific problems that have nothing to do with CS particularly, but that involve data and manipulation or navigation thereof. And that's one of the huge takeaways for us. Um, 
So I think there's very much that aspect of it. And also, too, more practically in the real world, I think it just starts to take away some of the magic. I mean, hopefully, for at least one person in this room, like the, the floppy disk that for years you might have taken for granted. I have no idea how that works. It's, it's just magic. It's not magic. It's just stupid little magnets that are either this way or that way on top of a cheap piece of plastic. And I think once you start to chip away at what appears to be magic for a lot of people, I think they just generally derive a lot more comfort. They can start pro solving problems on their own. And when your computer freezes, even if you don't know how to fix it, you probably think, oh, whoever wrote this program you know, must have had an infinite loop or some kind of cycle that just it got stuck in. And so it's no longer as intimidating or magical. And so that's huge for us, is giving students truly greater comfort over the course of those months. Thank you very much, Professor Mahan, for being here today. I, uh, I've been following your work for a long time. And I've been very impressed with uh, what you've achieved in terms of women's participation in, in computer science, which uh, our dean touched upon. Um, you know, many research has shown that not many women get into this field because typically it's a male-dominated field or whatever for whatever purpose. But uh, lots of uh, research from Cornell uh, University shows that if women are sh um, shown how they can make a difference in the world with the skills that they develop. Um, then they are much more apt to pursue this field. Mm -hmm. And I think you have attempted to do that in terms of your CS50 fairs, that uh, you engage, engage all your students in that way. And hopefully that is why um, more women students, female students are continuing. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely, our numbers have been inching upward slowly over the years, but in CS50 we're at 39% um, women as of this most recent year. In CS1 taught by Henry Leitner, we're actually at 50% this year for the first time, which is essentially the precursor to CS50. And that's actually consistent with some of our friends at UC Berkeley, Dan Garcia who teaches Berkeley's in, uh, intro class, which is now more women than men. So this trend has been gradually inching up such that hopefully this is a conversation that won't be as predominant in just a few years once we sort of cross that inflection point. But it's something we've definitely been mindful of CS50. At the very first week of class, we have those little amusement park clickers by which we keep track of not only how many students are coming in, but how many of them are men versus women so that we have longitudinal data over the past several years. What's been interesting, if not a little frustrating, is that we see 39% women coming in the door in the first week as we do in the last week of the semester. So a lot of the challenge, um, not to shirk responsibility, but predates the college level, unfortunately. And I think uh, some of that is the result of, I think, perceptions that start at the high school uh, level or even earlier. But we've done certain things. CS50 has not only a fair and a hackathon, we have something we call CS50 Puzzle Day, which is deliberately during shopping week on the Saturday in the first week of classes. And that was actually inaugurated to make a more broad appeal to men and to women, but especially to women to send the message on campus that computer science isn't about programming per se, it's not about video games or that sort of culture, it's about problem solving more generally. And Puzzle Day is an opportunity for students to come with us. We had 250 or so this past year in teams of four and work on problems that have nothing to do with computers whatsoever. Um, and that was intended to send a message that it, the field itself is very collaborative, it can be very social, um, and it's by no means necessarily the stereotype that a lot of folks might still have in their mind. Um, so you are basically the rock star of the MOOC world right now, and the MOOC world <laughs> is getting a fair amount of attention. You're also a standout professor at a decent school here. And I guess what I'm wondering about is if you could share with us what is going to happen this summer? How does someone like you strive to do better? Maybe talking about some of the things that you're trying to improve either with technology or visuals or your educational approach. Sure, that's a good question. Thank you for the kind remarks. Um, <laughs> I think what characterizes our whole team, and I'm, I'm not here alone, even if, though it's just Karen and myself up here, we have Ramon and Dan and Shelly and Chang and Colton and um, Andrew and Back, all of whom compose our, our video team and production team more generally, because we've increasingly been experimenting with new forms of video, not just planting cameras in the back of the room as we happen to be doing today, but experimenting with live video production. Right now, I'm guessing there's a hopefully non-zero number of people tuning in online, both from CS50X and maybe elsewhere on campus. We've most recently begun shooting in this beautiful new studio that um, FAS put together and Harvard more generally in Widener Library, which is a perfect marriage of sort of old and new. 
Um, it's a beautiful film studio via which we've been producing ourselves a show, a show, an episodic show we call CS50 Live. We aspire for it to be 22 minutes every couple of weeks, and it's actually meant to be a prototype for what I suspect lectures may evolve into. This is a show where I happen to be standing up next to sort of picture in picture, sort of, and this is making a comparison, but visually it's kind of like Daily Show style material, where we talk about what's happened in tech news recently. We take a couple of questions that have come up online from CS50X students or even the Extension School students who are currently enrolled to taking the class synchronously with us in the spring. And then we weave those into a conversation. And we also pre-produce quite a few segments. We recently chatted with uh, Professor Harry Lewis about the Mark I computer, which sits in the Harvard Science Center, uh, the original basic uh, source code for an interpreter written by Bill Gates and Paul Allen years ago that hangs in Maxwell Dworkin. Um, we're going to be doing some shoots out in Atlanta soon at a computer science conference and elsewhere and trying to weave together three minute to seven minute video segments, educational segments that I hope to in the future weave into lectures themselves. So lectures become even less this fall and next fall of me communicating words out of my mouth and really trying to choreograph an experience for students where we cut away to a video above for seven minutes and I no longer speak and we uh, throw a topic rather than uh, myself teaching it, having someone else, one of the teaching fellows in video form, having very carefully come up with some demonstration, getting it just right um, while still preserving some of the more human aspects where things go wrong in a very good way and trying to marry those two things. So for us right now, CS50 Live is meant to be this prototype of a new form of um, class, even though it happens to be currently temporarily packaged in this episodic show. Baby, thanks for coming and for a great class and for what you do. Help us understand your thinking about your planning of online instruction. Do you planning a course and planning your lessons? Do you begin with a set of competencies that you hope people will have at the end and then from there map backwards the kinds of activities that you think they should engage and so on? Is it more rapid prototyping, experiments? Just reveal for us your thinking about how you take a particular domain which, where you have been teaching, not online, but in, in, in uh, real classes, and then think about translating that into a new medium uh, where you have to reach very different students than the ones that you teach here in much greater numbers. It's a good question. I think I've tended to think fairly macroscopically about the syllabus to sort of figure out where do we start and what are the inputs to the problem. And that's, in the case of CS50, very disparate comfort levels for students. And what do we want the delta to be by the end of the semester? And then begin to sort of fill in the blanks iteratively. And where do I want to be roughly mid-semester? And how do we get there? And then for the online porting of a class, to be honest, I think what's really characterized CS50X is that unlike, I think, a lot of the MOOCs, it is not a course that's been designed to be a MOOC. It is a translation of CS50 proper to an online form, so much so that curricularly, pretty much technologically, the courses are one and the same. And we really do aspire to have students halfway across the world, even though they're tuning in online on a laptop or at school um, on a desktop computer, really feel like they're part of this class here. And so I was very averse, for instance, a year and a half ago to what seemed to be this trend of the lecture is dead and we need to have these chunked up videos interspersed with Q&A. It just seemed too easy or too obvious to me. Like surely that cannot be our innovation here. So we focus much more on the other extreme and we, for instance, shipped CS50's lectures in whole form. And we did weave some questions in, but even that we jettisoned this past year because I just didn't find it interesting or particularly novel. So we're increasingly focusing on I think creating opportunities for students to engage asynchronously. CS50X, for instance, this year, it's a 12-month course. And even that, I think, is a silly, arbitrary cutoff. We just kind of need logistically to switch over to new content next year. Um, but we're increasingly trying to create opportunities for students to kind of engage and disengage and hopefully get out of it what they want. Because one of the biggest takeaways from version one of CS50X was that out of the 150,000 people that registered last year, 100,000 of them engaged in some form, watched content, did problem sets, participated in the online forums, but only about 1,500 people finished the course in a traditional way. And this too has been a hang up for me. We had tens of thousands of people, very nice people who just wanted to come and go and fill in some blanks in their knowledge or dabble here or there and get out of it what they wanted to. And so I realized we spent a disproportionate amount of time in the first iteration of our MOOC on the mechanics of the class. How are we gonna uh, collect all of those homeworks? How are we gonna grade them automatically? And we spent much less time unfortunately on the pedagogy. And so that's really where we've refocused our efforts this year. And CS50 Live is demonstrative of that, trying to think about the class and how to teach and how to reach dis different types of students as opposed to the mechanics of a traditional course. 
So I think we have time for one more question before closing. Does that sound good? So actually, to build on Derek's question, you talked about sort of near-term next steps. What happens when you think further out, five years, 10 years beyond, for you, for CS50, for computational thinking? It's a good question. So I think it's probably going to happen that CS50 will become more self-directed. I don't anticipate having this very formulaic two lectures a week all semester long. Not because I think the lecture is dead. I just think we can use our limited time together much more effectively. And case in point of this is we spend uh, three hours on Monday nights, three on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. in the house dining halls, which are actually too small for us now. Um, and it's filled with computer science students working alongside, working either solo on projects or collaboratively with their classmates or rubbing shoulders with their humanities friends or social sciences friends, sort of peeking over shoulders, curious as to what they're working on. And this has become, to borrow a common phrase, a very active learning experience for students. And I would much rather we as and our staff of 110 uh, teaching fellows and course assistants spend time sort of in the trenches, working with students, helping to unblock them and helping them wrestle with problems as opposed to me more traditionally preparing a lecture and standing before people and talking at people. So I think we'll see less in the way of traditional lectures, more in the way of sort of an experience, maybe once a week, and more time, hopefully, especially if the spaces allow, and that too is a challenge on campus, um, much more interactive opportunities for students. Thank you so much. Well,